I'm Megan Van Batum. And I'm Ivania Montes. And welcome to CBU TV. Our first story addresses a tragedy that took place in Riverside near Liberty Elementary School. A babysitter and a two-year-old passed away after getting hit by a vehicle. I was able to speak to a resident who lives in the neighborhood where the crime was committed. The memorial continues for Helia Morales, a babysitter, as well as a two-year-old little boy that she babysat as they were both struck by a vehicle as they were picking up his older sister here at Liberty Elementary. As you can see behind me, the community has been gathering pictures and flowers and candles just to remember the two individuals. Not to mention the community has also started a rosary where they're asking people to come and pray for the losses of these two individuals. I had a chance to speak with the lady that lives the house directly where the incident took place. Para mí yo pido justicia. Por el niño, simplemente por el niño, porque yo también tengo muchos niños aquí cuidando y no puedo salir. Justice is all Maria Ortiz, a Riverside resident, is asking for since two-year-old Julian Ross and his babysitter, Egilia Morales, were struck and killed by a 2020 Range Rover. Morales and the two-year-old were picking up his seven-year-old sister from Liberty Elementary. According to preliminary investigation, a 46-year-old Riverside resident was driving the Range Rover westbound on Haines Street and approaching Roosevelt. The three pedestrians began crossing Roosevelt Street in the marked crosswalk as the SUV entered the intersection. Witnesses say the babysitter was able to push the little girl out of the way. Chiquito, la señora pasaba con su niño de la mano a recogerlos todos los días. Aquí en la tarde, ella pasaba. La señora no estaba mayor, lo único que ella estaba enferma de un pie. Y te va su gordo. ¿Y cómo voy a creer que la la persona que la atropelló no la iba a ver? Although the Riverside resident driving the Range Rover was cooperating at the scene with deputies, the neighborhood is asking the elementary to put a camera within the school zone. This would help avoid incidents like this one, especially since little kids are around. Ortiz has also mentioned to me that there are no current funds to help pay for the services of little Julian. De menos. De menos también pedimos que le ayude a las, las papás del, del niño a que le, le ayuden para su... Sepultura, ya no son pobres, no tienen, viven rentando un cuartito nomás, no tienen ellos. Entonces, pidemos que los ayuden, por favor, porque no, no se puede quedar eso así. Now, with speaking with the neighbors from the community, they are trying to seek justice for this incident as once again there are little kids involved, not to mention the lives that were lost. Reporting live in Riverside, I am Ivania Montes. Thank you, Ivania. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the families of the victims. The skyrocketing of gas prices continues to raise concerns all around the world as the war in Ukraine rages on. Inflation has affected the prices of other products for sale as well, and many question when things will return to normal. CBTV reporter Brett Rosen spoke to economics professor Bob Navar and a few students on campus about the horrifying issue. Hey Lancers, can you believe only about a year ago we thought $4 to $5 price gas was way too expensive? Well now, today in 2022, we find ourselves scrambling to find the $6 price gallon of gas because right now it's closer to 7 Today I got the chance to ask some CBU Lancers and an economics professor about this gas inflation crisis. I also got to ask him about how it's affecting them and what else can it affect. Let's see what they had to say. I'm a commuter all the way from Hemet, which is over an hour away, so it's like 100 miles round trip for me every day. Um, yeah, my gas prices have gone up from like 45 a tank to 60, 70, depending on where I'm filling up. And luckily we got the room in the budget to afford that right now, but and yeah, it's taking a hit. We don't got as much entertainment money, but right now we're making it work, trying to find those deals. Costco's a godsend right now close. I'm about a little over an hour away. So I like to go home on weekends and spend time with my family, but it's been harder to do that knowing that gas is so much more expensive and it takes a lot of my gas to drive home. And so I'm lucky that where I live kind of remote and our gas is a little bit cheaper. So I, t I try to fill up when I'm there, but it's still like hard and it's a lot more stressful now to go home. So after asking some students about their experiences with the rising gas prices, 
As seen Professor Bob Navarre what truly inflation is, he states that inflation is just the idea of all goods and services rising in price altogether. He also talks about how inflation not only can affect the prices of one thing, but it can also affect the prices of other things. For example, the prices of gas going up can affect the prices of food, goods, and delivery services. He states that it is so hard to keep track and maintain inflation due to the fact that inflation just causes more inflation. So, meaning, us as the general public really can't change anything. All we can do, like Professor Bob Navar states, is hope and pray it gets better. Well, Lancers, hearing what CBU students had to say and Professor Bob Navar about the economics of gas and how it's affecting everyone involved, I sure hope it comes down very quickly. For CBU TV, I'm Brett Rosen. See you next time. This month's news rundown includes the visit of President Biden to the capital of Belgium, where he met with NATO and G7 world leaders to discuss Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Four journalists were detained in the town of Melitopol, and they were held in an unknown location for several hours before being released. Their conditions are currently unknown to the public. The latest news on the subject is that journalist Victoria Roshana has been re-detained and has been missing since March 15th. Supreme Court confirmation hearing for nominee Kensa G. Brown Jackson. If confirmed, she would be the first African American woman sworn into the Supreme Court. President Biden agreed to accept 100,000 Ukrainian refugees and donated $1 billion to help the European nations dealing with Ukrainian refugees. Reporter Diana Villa had the opportunity to sit down and talk to a couple involved in the CBU Encounter program, where they are now working on a new refugee center in Poland. Missionaries around the world are offering opportunities for service. The CBU Encounter program with the Spiritual Life Department has been helping connect with others to help minister communities. Joe and Minnie help minister university students in Krakow, Poland by teaching English and sharing the gospel with them to help them engage with other university students. Joe and Minnie are currently helping relief individuals that are struggling in Poland due to the Ukraine war by participating and to taking in refugees through the ministry. Uh, we primarily uh, as far as personally taking in refugees. Uh, usually it's ones that we've known from the past. Uh, we are uh, constantly searching for uh, accommodations for them, whether it be temporary for two to three days or you know a month or long term. We're going to open a refugee center uh, staffed by Ukrainian believers in Krakow in the uh, hopefully within two to three weeks. Um, we're hoping to sign a contract on a housing unit um, this week and then um, provides, um, you know, get things up and running, painted. It needs, it hasn't been occupied for eight months. So it really needs some major cleaning and, and work done on it. Um, but hopefully we will be opening that within the coming, within the coming weeks to provide um, housing for maybe up to 20 refugees. We also um, just assist local churches who are housing refugees um, by providing, uh, we've cooked meals, um, we are transportation, delivery, going to the store and buying either food and delivering it or going to the store and buying um, baby goods, baby goods, um, mattresses, um, you know, sleeping um, sheets and duvets and Towels. Uh, towels and just supplies in general. We are starting a yeah. virtual English foreign language program um, for Ukrainians, um, engaging virtual English teaching EFL to Ukrainians virtually. And then finally, I think one of the ways that CBU can help is to come. Uh, yeah. You have a team that's scheduled to come in May. And we really need them here. We really need them here. I <laughs> uh, would really love to have them here. I understand, you know, from a security purposes and um, I think um, from a, of, from parents' standpoints. From parents' standpoints and... of, you know, we're really close to the war, but, you know, we're not really that close. Um, <laughs> so obviously we want CBU here uh, to help us minister to our university students. As well as um, Ukrainians. As well as Ukrainians, yeah. For more information, visit the Breakthrough Krakow page on Facebook. For CBU TV, I'm Diana Villa. After having their season cut off short in 2020 due to the pandemic, reporter Elmer Mejia Sakastume had
had the opportunity to talk to some of the soccer and real competitors about how it feels to be back competing again after a two-year hiatus. Intramurals is one of those events heavily anticipated by many CBU students, and the 2020 intramural soccer season was no exception. However, unlike previous years, disaster would strike. As we all know, COVID-19 would disrupt the world and grind everything to a halt. CBU officials canceled the season halfway through just as the playoffs were about to get underway. With the 2020 season being cut short, many teams were disappointed in learning that they had to stop competing, especially those teams that were set to compete in the playoffs. We had a really good uh, start. Uh, we were, I believe, 4-1. Uh, we already played five games going up to playoffs. I think we, th we actually secured our spot. Um, but yeah, that's, the team was very, uh, uh, we had the potential. And after the pandemic hit, uh, I was hoping for this, this whole school semester not to get canceled. But unfortunately, it got canceled, you know, so um, I was a bit devastated, but uh, this was my sophomore year and I was praying that uh, that uh, I get to have at least one more season, which right now we are having one more season. So. The 2022 intramural season is currently underway and it has reached the halfway point. There are only two games left for each team until the playoffs start. While attending the games, I talked to many of the student athletes and they've all said how excited and a blessing it is to be back playing against each other. But who will win the intramural trophy in the end? Right now, at first, I thought um, England was going to take it, but uh, or even South Korea. Like uh, I always, I sort of saw uh, South Korea and uh, England have a potential of uh, of uh, making it into the finals. But you know, what you know, anything can happen at this point, and uh, they both have a slow start. So uh, as of now, for my um, from my uh, personal opinion, I think either Zambia or um, or Kenya at the finals. But maybe that's one win at this point, so I can I can say what who's going to win. But I actually want to see both of them play as well. No. But who will win the intramural trophy in the end? So far, the top five teams being England, Portugal, Kenya, Zambia, and Ireland all look strong and have a great chance of winning the trophy. It's going to be exciting watching these amazing games play out in the playoffs. That's all the intramural sports we have for you so far. For CBTV, I'm Elmer Mejia Sagastume. Wow, it's going to be exciting to see who ends up getting the trophy in the end. With more exciting news, the Festival of Colors is back again. Reporter Wyatt McElmurray attended the Festival of Colors to talk about its significance to CBU. Hey Lancers, we're here at the Festival of the Colors today where CBU gets to meet the Indians culture and come together and celebrate. I got to sit down with Courtney Watson to get a little bit deeper meaning on what the Festival of Colors is all about. Let's get into it. So what is the Festival of Colors and what yeah. it's all about? Yeah, great. Uh, Festival of Color is an opportunity for us to highlight one of the second, actually the second largest uh, international population on campus, which is students from India. So um, we try to take elements of Indian culture, like food, dancing, uh, performances, um, bartering, and then we incorporate that into the actual event. So students are given fake Indian money and they can go and barter for goods to get either chai or samosas. They can get henna tattoos, temporary henna tattoos. <laughs> um, and it's also an opportunity for the international students from India to get up on stage and to show off their culture a little bit, either through dancing or singing. Um, usually there's some sort of group flash mob, so <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, which is appropriate for a country as colorful and as fun as India. Um, and then at the end of the event, they have uh, a giant color throw. So um, in India, to celebrate the start of spring, kids will go out and will throw color and water at each other. It's a game that they play. And so we've adopted part of that at CBU. We don't do the water piece, but mm -hmm. we do the color throw. And how do you think that affects like with relationships with students that are from America and are from India, just like coming together in this culture event? Mm. How do you, how's the bond formed there? Mm. That's a really good question. And that's one of the things that we get most excited for at, here at the International Center is seeing domestic students get to taste culture that they may not be familiar with and then gain a better understanding for it. Um, so we've seen our domestic students absolutely have their worldview expanded by getting to be at events like Festival of Color or Lunar New Year, for example, which is about Chinese and Asian culture. Um, and so it's really exciting to see them learn how to barter a little bit or taste a samosa for the first time. Mm. And these things that are so common to Indian, their Indian friends, they're now getting a chance to see what it's actually like. For CBU TV, I'm Wyatt McElmurray. It's exciting to have the Festival of Colors back again on campus. Our very own reporter, Nasa Dominguez, and I attended the LA Fashion Week in which they were helping support Ukraine. Let's check out how they're doing that. 
LA Fashion Week this year returned with several designers at the Majestic in downtown Los Angeles. Designers like Fernando Alberto Atelier from Honduras, Jelena George Malsevic from Serbia, Jonathan Guzman from the U.S., and Wilfredo Gerardo from Mexico, to name a few. The show, put on by Art Hearts Fashion in Los Angeles, began March 17th and ended March 20th, highlighting and exhibiting each designer's work on the runway. The Arts Hearts Fashion team hosted four days of runways in downtown Los Angeles. The fashion show not only featured runways, ways, but also a variety of art on display at the show. A portion of the proceeds from their ticket sales for the runways is going to support the war effort in Ukraine. Reporting from downtown LA, for CBU-TV, I am Ignacio Dominguez. Reporter Marquise Brown brought us a very special story all the way from Manhattan, New York. He spoke to the owner of a plant nursery called Soil Vibes. Her goal is to connect all types of people and cultures together through their love of plants. Let's check it out. New York City's economy is heavily supported by the domestic and international tourists who visit the city annually. According to the 2019 New York Census Bureau, roughly 390,000 workers declared that their primary source of income was from the city's tourism industry. Unfortunately, the decline of travelers to the city in past years has resulted in high rates of unemployment and an increased enclosure among smaller self-owned businesses. The reopening of the United States in November of last year has sparked hope in the business owners of New York, who have been patiently waiting for the return of travelers since March of 2020. Small self-owned businesses especially have taken a hit from the little travel coming into the state, but are determined to get through this difficult period of time. Shauna Taylor is a Manhattan resident and business owner of Soil Vibes, a small plant nursery located just minutes away from the hustle of Times Square. Her shop is located on 6th Avenue and West 37th Street in the Herald Square District Shopping Center. She describes her vision for Soil Vibes as being a space of authenticity where people can come as themselves and bond with others who share a love for plants. I wanted to create a space where, you know, people can come, pick a plant, talk, be regular, you know, you know, no judgment zone here and just, you know, get in tune with yourself, get in tune with nature and just, you know, be a vibe. Shana Taylor mentioned the difficulty she faces due to the pandemic and talked about some of the financial struggles she deals with living in the city where the cost of living is 28% more expensive than in Los Angeles. The prices are insane. Um, I don't even go shopping in the city. Like I will probably, it's easier for me to like shop on Amazon because, or, you know, because going to the corner store, like their eggs are like $6. And I'm just like, for what? Right. So it's just really, it is an un, un, imbalanced here because they do forget about the, you know, lower income, middle class people in Manhattan that do live here. Needless to say, she is still grateful to her community for supporting her business through donations to her GoFundMe and for purchasing plants from her nursery. For those outside of the New York community planning on visiting the city in the coming months, she urges them to research the New York culture and find small businesses that they can support during their stay. Just be aware that, you know, this is glam, it's not all glam and glitter here, <laughs> you know, so just be aware and just be a little bit more empathetic and research and just don't judge people once you get here. According to the World Travel and Tourist Council, U.S. domestic tourist spending is forecast to reach more than $1.1 trillion for the year, surpassing pre-pandemic levels by 11.3%. This means great things for New York City's economy. Reporting from Manhattan, New York, for CBU-TV, I am Marquise Brown. To close off the show, for many that don't know, I will be graduating this May. So I personally wanted to take the time to thank everyone here at Lansom Media Group and CBU TV for allowing me to have a place where I could learn and grow into the journalist that I am today. It has been such an honor and a blessing from God to have been the director for CBU TV, and I cannot wait to see how much this publication will grow. I will also be graduating this May. Working with Lancer Media Group has truly been such an incredible experience. I'm very grateful for all the opportunities, so thank you. And so with that, I'm Megan Mambato. And I'm Ivania Montes, and this is CBU-TV.